Good morning from WKYT News. Welcome to Kentucky Newsmakers. I'm Bill Bryant. Later, leaders from the Kentucky League of Cities will talk about the challenges and needs of communities across the state. That's later. But first, the Attorney General of the Commonwealth is here with us. After a narrow victory, Andy Bashir has hit the ground running in Frankfurt and has reached across party lines in one initiative with the First Lady. Bashir indicates he will be going after scams. He says he has issued an alert a week since he took office on that front. He's pushing legislation to combat repetitive sex crimes against children and vulnerable adults. He plans to crack down on human trafficking. We'll also ask how does he feel about open meetings and records. And as you know, the Attorney General holds the same office that launched his father's political career in the late 1970s. And after two terms as governor, Steve Bashir is back in the forefront, leading a grassroots effort to preserve the health care expansion that he put in place. How does the new AG feel about his father's continued activism? Attorney General Andy Bashir. Shears with us today, and we'll wait to get to that question. But thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's get uh, first off uh, to some issues. And uh, as we were getting ready to go with this program, you have indicated that you may intervene uh, on a life insurance situation where uh, the state of Kentucky has a law that says life insurance companies have an obligation to go and chase down beneficiaries. And that has been challenged, right. and it's particularly uh, to do with uh, the older cases, right? Uh, it is. Uh, Bill, as Attorney General, I am the chief consumer advocate uh, for Kentuckians, and I love my job. It gives me a chance to protect Kentuckians. And what this case is about is a law that was passed by the legislature that says that these life insurance or burial insurance companies have to periodically check the death records. And when one of their policyholders is on those death records, they have to send a notice to the beneficiaries. Uh, how that helps Kentuckians is you and I might not know if our parents or our grandparents even had a policy. And without this law, uh, you might never know that, and those companies might never pay out. And that's part of the contract that they signed. Uh, insurance companies challenge this, saying, oh, the law only applied going forward. But the sponsor, uh, Bob Dameron, has already been out there saying, absolutely not. This was intended to fix a problem. Uh, that was there at that time. So the Department of Insurance uh, defended that law. This is about defending laws on the books. And defended it and won at the circuit court. Uh, they lost at the Court of Appeals and they were at the Supreme Court. And this was fully briefed. Everything was in. Oral argument was two days later. Uh, and pretty much in the dark of night, the Department of Insurance under this new administration totally dropped the suit. And the Supreme Court then dismissed it. I can't let that happen. Uh, the Department of Insurance has a responsibility to protect Kentuckians, to protect those policyholders. And if they are not going to live up to their responsibility, the Attorney General is going to step in. Can you pick up uh, with the appeal, or do you have to start over? Well, we, it, it's going to be an uphill battle because this was dropped at the very last moment. This is really a dereliction of duty. Uh, the Department of Insurance has an absolute duty to Kentuckians, and they have absolutely dropped the ball. So we're going to be filing a motion in the coming days before the Supreme Court that says, let us step in, because one of the parties here is the Commonwealth of Kentucky, is the people of Kentucky. And I'm not only the chief legal officer, uh, but I'm the people's lawyer. And we're going to ask them, make sure that the people of Kentucky are represented here. Don't let... You know, uh, uh, an action that happens in the, in, the, in the dark of night that leads to a dismissal, uh, leave these Kentucky policyholders um, pretty much out of luck. Uh, so we're going to do everything we can because I think that's my duty. You've indicated that you have been surprised by the number of ongoing scams that your oh, yes. office is asked to look into. IRS scams, uh, uh, you know, uh, scams where people are told that they're supposed to be on a jury mm -hmm. and this kind of thing. And uh, what can the Attorney General do about those things? We work on it every single day. Uh, scams uh, are out of control. Uh, there are more scams, especially directed at our seniors, than I think we've ever seen in our history. Consumer Reports uh, reported that last year more than $3 billion was stolen from our seniors in the United States alone. We have put out more than one uh, scam alert on big scams a week since I've been Attorney General. Uh, Thursday, uh, we had a, a, a press conference with sheriffs from all over your region, including Sheriff Witt, Sheriff Melton, uh, uh, sheriffs from Bourbon County, uh, representatives from Madison County Sheriff's Office, uh, for a new scam that's particularly offensive. And that's people, scam artists, are using the names of real sheriff deputies, calling people claiming that they, they owe money for a federal warrant or uh, IRS or any other type and, and saying if they don't pay, they're going to come arrest them. That is so offensive. 
using the name of the people who are out there protecting us every single day. Uh, but here's what I tell your viewers. Uh, a sheriff's deputy, the IRS, or anybody else would never ask you for money over the phone. If you get a call that asks you for money over the phone, hang up, call our office, call your local sheriff, and make sure your parents, grandparents, friends, and others uh, know that. The best way that we can stop these scams is to hang up and to not let them profit. You have teamed up with the First Lady, uh, yes. uh, the, the, which is interesting, the governor that you have uh, kind of uh, criticized here already today the, the, uh, on an initiative on child abuse uh, training. Uh, what uh, is the goal there and uh, why was it important to you to reach across party lines on that? Well, first, let me say with, with uh, the lawsuit we're stepping into, my criticism is aimed at the Department of Insurance and their duty, uh, independent. Uh, from anything else. But uh, the First Lady and I came together uh, on child abuse prevention. And there is nothing political about child abuse and its prevention. And there never should be. Uh, and she uh, was amazing, uh, is passionate about this issue, and helped us bring so much more attention to it. What the two of us announced together is the first significant uh, large-scale collaboration between advocacy groups and government groups uh, to push out training all across the Commonwealth. And this training kind of shifts the paradigm a little bit in how we have uh, tried to prevent child abuse. It, it moves the training a little bit from the children who are the least powerful uh, to stop the abuse uh, to parents and, and, and other adults that are out there to recognize how these predators uh, end up profiling and approaching our kids. And I'll tell you, this is an area where my office is laser focused. Uh, in the last biennium, the AG's office helped, the last two years, helped in removing about 30 child sex offenders uh, be removed from the streets. In my first month, we've removed eight. We are on track to more than triple the number of these predators we can pull off the street. And the last one we indicted tells you how important it is. It's a firefighter in Somerset, somebody who is in a position of authority. And I have a five and a six year old. I cannot live with that, and I will not. It can be very difficult uh, for uh, children to have to testify, and yes. the law currently requires them to be a, a specific, and vulnerable adults as well, to be specific right. about dates and times and that kind of thing. And you are pushing uh, some legislation uh, that would uh, mm -hmm. more easily demonstrate a pattern, right? That's right. Right now there is uh, what I believe is a loophole in our child sex abuse laws, and what it requires is that that child victim who is already traumatized uh, to testify about the exact time, date, location, and specific specifics of any instance of abuse uh, that is charged. Now, for a child, that's already difficult, and many of these victims are being uh, assaulted, are being abused multiple times a week in locations and by people that are supposed to make them feel safe. It specifically came from a case about a six-year-old child in Hopkinsville whose mom was deployed to protect our families and whose stepfather uh, then orally and anally sodomized that little girl more than five times a week, more than three to five times a week for five months. And that little girl's mind, even if she hadn't been traumatized, isn't in a place where you can do and give that specific testimony, but she can give credible testimony. And so we've got a group of sex offenders out there, some of the worst of the worst that right now we can't prosecute. And this bill is going to do something about it. Andy Bashir is the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We're back with him in just a moment. We'll take on some other issues later. The folks from the Kentucky League of Cities talk about uh, a lot of needs in communities and uh, some of their agenda at the state legislature. Welcome back. We continue our discussion now with Kentucky Attorney General Andy Bashir, and uh, there are some uh, laws that the Attorney General uh, is asked to interpret from time to time, those open meeting laws uh, in particular. What is your general approach to that? Uh, there are some uh, uh, local officials maybe who don't want the prying eyes of the public <laughs> well, <laughs> to see what's there. And there are some protections on uh, some documents, right? Well, there are, but government is supposed to be open. And our open records and open meetings laws uh, mean that any citizen uh, can learn about what their government is doing. And it's absolutely critical that we not only enforce them, 
but we err on the side of transparency. Now, there are certain documents, there are investigations and other things that while going on, there may be reasons that uh, you, you can't disclose to the public. But in general, uh, every citizen of the Commonwealth deserves to know what's going on in their government. You uh, want to move ahead on this uh, testing of uh, DNA ki kits that are being held by the state. The governor's indicated he is putting uh, additional money in to deal with that. I yes, and, and I'd like your viewers to think about this concept a little differently. I worry that our use of the term rape kits makes people think of a box on a shelf when this really are victims. Victims of some of the worst crimes you could imagine that had the courage to come in and get what can be a five hour forensic exam. And we have not sought justice on behalf of those victims. So while we have to get them tested, the next step is the investigation and the ultimate prosecution uh, that, that leads from those DNA hits. And when they did this in Detroit with about the same number of, of, of rape kits, they identified over 300 potential serial rapists. So we've got a lot of work to do. Now we have a grant from the United States Attorney's Office that's going to help us test kits going backwards. The governor's budget uh, has funding in it to try to prevent a backlog from happening at the state crime lab going forward. But what's in the middle that we now have to address is really seeking that justice. It's from testing through prosecution. And there are going to be some costs involved in that. And I want to make sure that in this legislative session, we do everything we can so that we can seek justice for those victims as quickly as possible. These are tight uh, fiscal times. You have uh, announced that you are turning over more than $17 million to the general fund, and that is coming from some uh, money from lawsuits that the state that's, has won? That's correct. Uh, we announced the other day that we are returning uh, $9.5 million directly to the general fund and another $8.5 million to be allocated by the General Assembly towards drug treatment and education. That's a $17.5 million return uh, from an office that asks every year for about 10 to $11 million uh, to operate. We're a pretty good deal. And that doesn't get into what we return to Medicaid. Uh, since I've been in office, we've returned two and a half million dollars. Over the last two years, we returned 70 million dollars to Medicaid to help balance that budget. So the Attorney General's office, we protect families. And you can't put a value on that. We protect families, whether it's from crime or scams, but we do bring a huge amount of value uh, back to the people of Kentucky. I'll give you one other statistic I'm proud of. Uh, our office that deals with uh, rate making, that represents you and I and your viewers on our utility bills, has saved uh, your viewers over $230 million in requested rate increases uh, over the last couple of years. We work hard. Your father, Steve Beshear, left uh, office a popular uh, two-term governor, made it clear going out the door that he was going to be speaking out from time to time, and now <laughs> he is uh, part of a grassroots effort to convince yeah. the current governor to reverse the pledges that he made during the campaign to uh, do away with uh, the uh, Connect uh, mm -hmm. State Health Exchange and to uh, scale back the Medicaid expansion that your father did. Uh, what is your reaction to, uh, to your father being uh, out there and aggressive and, uh, and uh, speaking about uh, the one who followed him into office. Well, governing isn't about campaign promises. It's doing the right things for the people of Kentucky. When you run, you may be running from one party or another, but once you are in office, you represent everyone. And Connect and the expansion of Medicaid are absolutely critical for the health of our people, and they work. They are both considered gold standards in how they were done all across the country. We just had the largest drop in our uninsured rate uh, across the country of, of, of any state. I mean, we are doing this well. And let me say, as Attorney General, you are the chief consumer advocate. And if our people are moved from Connect to the National Exchange, they will pay more, get less, and have more problems with it. This is not a good deal uh, for the citizens of Kentucky. And I'd expect the governor to do the right thing, ultimately, for the people of Kentucky. And in the end, this is going to dramatically improve the health of the citizens of our state if it's left into place, and everybody will get the credit for that. Qu quickly, do you uh, anticipate or are you contemplating any possible legal action such as that you're doing in the insurance case uh, if uh, the governor moves forward? Well, uh, you, dismantling something like Connect occurs in a highly regulated environment. In fact, no state has ever taken down a successful exchange. So there may be a lot of legal hurdles for the administration. I'm sure that they are looking at those and they will be following those. Uh, my sole job is to make sure uh, that everyone follows the law. 
All right, the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, Andy Bashir, has been our guest. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Hope you'll keep us updated throughout your tenure. We'll do it. And we hope you'll stay with us now. We're back in just a moment with leaders from the Kentucky League of Cities pushing a community agenda in Frankfort. Back in a moment. Welcome back to WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. Here in the Bluegrass State, we may have a rural image of rolling hills and farms, but in reality, most Kentuckians live in a city or town. They elect mayors and councils or commissions to see after their needs. Residents of those cities have higher than ever expectations, but of course they want their taxes kept low. When the police respond, a fire truck or assault truck rolls, a park or a pool opens up for the summer, it's all because of the work at Kentucky's city halls. The Kentucky League of Cities represents municipalities statewide. They have an agenda and some concerns with the legislature in session right now. A long standing issue is 911 funding. Those emergency lines have long been paid for by taxes on landlines, which, as you know, are disappearing fast as people switch to wireless. And the shortfall in the state road fund could leave cities unable to repair streets. Those are a couple of items we'll discuss today with Jonathan Steiner and J.D. Cheney. They are here from the Kentucky League of Cities. Gentlemen, thank you. We appreciate you coming in. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Yes. And uh, first of all, let's get right to this uh, 911 issue. I know that is a, a grave concern for cities because it's been building for years. Are cities to the point now that they're having to take money from other areas to run those emergency dispatch centers? We are seeing that, absolutely. Uh, we were fortunate to get a, a good decision in the Supreme Court out of Campbell County that will now fix some of this problem. It will allow uh, cities to to look at a method to include funding 911 services uh, on something like, for example, a property tax bill. So that was a, a really positive decision. Uh, but there are still other issues that we're going to the legislature with to talk about fixing. And that's been the number one priority for both cities and counties, one that we, we share because uh, more than half of the funding is now coming out of general funds, whereas those landline fees that you mentioned used to fund the entire operations for 911 to connect the citizens with their first responders. Uh, so they're looking for ways to replace that. Campbell County decision out of the Supreme Court helps that quite a bit, but we have issues with governance. All the wireless fees go to Frankfurt and then are redistributed uh, back to the local local jurisdictions in a, in a formulaic uh, way set out in statute and there's a board that governs that process. Uh, underrepresented with local officials, we want to fix that uh, as well as uh, encouraging consolidation uh, and efficiencies and transparency in the entire uh, operation of the 911. Uh, does the public generally come to meetings about 911 and uh, do they express their concerns? I mean, I would imagine there are more calls going to those centers than ever. Uh, right, and that's the issue that's because the because you've more wireless users, more use, more dispatches are needed to to process those phone calls. Used to, someone was on the side of the road uh, in, uh, or a wreck, you'd have somebody stop and use a payphone or call when they got home. Now you have multiple calls, and the center has to process every one of those calls, uh, hundreds of calls potentially on the same incident. Do the, do the prospects look good of uh, finding a resolution? I think so. I think we've got a lot of support lined up on both sides, and, and I'm hopeful something will happen. And additionally on that, it's, uh, it's also the technology changes so quickly. I mean, think about your cell phone and all the apps you have following your location, et cetera. Well, people expect 911 to know where you are as well, and uh, the technology is changing, and it's getting more and more expensive. Yeah, I think there's a requirement coming that they be able to accept texts as well. That's right? correct. So, Next yeah. generation, mm -hmm. 911. Yeah. All right, so we'll see where that one goes. And then the uh, price of gasoline is way down, and as a result, so are the... Uh, uh, it was always the, the funds going into the, uh, the state highway fund, the road fund. Governor Bevan announced that he plans to cut the money that is sent to communities for road projects and repairs. Are uh, you urging some other support? There is approach a, to that. So there is a formula that splits uh, road aid money between counties and cities, and it goes back to the 1940s. It's, it has, hasn't been changed, and as you mentioned, uh, more and more people are living in cities in Kentucky. It's really a metropolitan state, and so. We think it makes sense to spend the money where the people are living and the people are driving, and we'd like to reallocate that formula based on uh, where people are putting the most miles on the roads. Uh, you know, Governor, I think Governor Bevan uh, didn't have a choice but to, to make the adjustments based on the, on the 
consensus forecasting uh, group's receipts on the road fund. It's not entirely unexpected uh, that they were going to drop and that floor was going to drop. They did hold a floor uh, last year, probably lower than we would have liked to have seen, but uh, they did do that. Uh, and he, I think he made that cut or, or announced that cut because he, because he had to. It wasn't a discretionary mm -hmm. uh, action on his, his point. But the formula has to be has to be readjusted in the future to get more money into into the urban areas because you have greater use there. And so this is a, a, an issue that divides cities and counties, urban and rural, uh, a little bit. But but the most of it, most of their funds in the county roads come directly from Frankfurt out of the gas tax. This is another example of an area where city officials have to take out of their general funds, even though our expenditures are the same. Only about 20% of the expenditures of city governments actually is funded by the gas tax receipts. So 80% is coming out of city general funds for city streets. I would think city officials also are faced with uh, increased uh, demands from the public. They want the snow removed and they want uh, the, the, you know, lots of uh, projects done, the sidewalks and so forth. And then there are requirements from the federal and state government about uh, the, the safety standards and so forth. Uh, again, the sidewalks, the streets have to, uh, to meet those codes, right? Certainly, there are mandates that come down from the state and federal level that, that require cities to do certain things. So a lot of times cities don't have control of their own destinies and their own budgets. We always talk about home rule and local control and how important that is for cities anywhere, not just Kentucky. And uh, that's really our hallmark. That's what we stand for. How tough is it for cities to, uh, to meet the requirements that are put on them by the federal government, whether it is water standards, uh, pollution standards, as we talk about the requirements of, for safety for their fire and police departments and so forth, when they really don't have a lot of avenues to get uh, revenue? Uh, they can only go so many places and, and they don't have the options. Even if uh, city uh, voters had the right to say yes or no, they aren't given the right to, to put up that option, right? That's right. I think it's always harder. The further away a decision is made from a community and painted with a broad brush, the harder it is for it to, to really um, be a good decision. I think decisions ought to be made locally and it, it is an issue of of raising revenues and, and having revenues to meet all these demands, it's really easy for someone to say, you know, you need to be doing this in Lexington or you need to be doing this in Owensboro, and, uh, but not giving them the tools to do it. Well, and some Kentucky cities uh, collect these restaurant taxes and mm -hmm. are able to do that, but then they are told how that has to be spent. Uh, you are working to try to get some flexibility for cities on that, right? Right. We're trying to reform the restaurant tax because right now uh, only certain cities have the tax. And, and it's based on uh, whether it's mom and pa that own the diner or a chain that's in there, whatever, at the end of the month, whatever their, their formula is for the money that they brought in, they have to pay a tax on that. And we'd like to see that changed where that tax goes away and that the tax is instead on the consumer, on the front end, people coming through, passing through Kentucky, people going out to eat, having a meal, and paying that tax on consumption as opposed to ma and pa having to pay it out of, of their receipts at the end of the month. Senate Bill 166 that got introduced on Tuesday of this week addresses the issue directly. Uh, Senator Carpenter from uh, from Madison County is carrying the carrying the bill for us on on the floor that expands that option uh, to to all cities in Kentucky, not just some of the smaller cities that have had the authority in the past. And it does eliminate the tax on productivity, the tax on uh, the earnings of the business, and allows a consumption base tax uh, that would generate additional revenues that cities can invest in tourism infrastructure and in recreation infrastructure and things related to economic development. But again, it would just give them the right to do would that, give right? Them it the say, would not it. say that, you, exactly. that, that these cities there would must have, to, have that tax. There would have to be a vote at the local level to do, an, to do an ordinance. You were pushing something that we're not hearing the momentum on at this point, and that is this lift tax that would let uh, localities decide if they wanted to levy an extra penny uh, sales tax. Uh, on uh, for a specific project for a limited time, and again, the cities would have the right to uh, accept or reject that. Uh, do you expect an amendment to that effect to get to the voters this session? It, uh, it has been introduced, and um, last year it made it uh, through the House, and so it's, it's a tough process because it needs, it needs more votes than just uh, a regular bill to get through the chambers and to get the governor's signature before it can even go before the voters. So uh, I would love to see that happen, but it is a, it's a tough road.
This addresses that antiquated uh, constitutional provision that limits our revenue options that you just addressed. I think I think it's got good momentum and sh again shifts the model and allows some element of consumption-based taxation rather than just focusing it on the productivity of businesses and, and citizens. You've also uh, been pushing what's called P3 legislation, public-private partnerships, and uh, allowing some flexibility mm -hmm. for more cities to get involved with uh, with business in getting some projects done. Uh, does that uh, have good uh, prospects? That, that bill passed the House floor yesterday. Representative Combs uh, carried that. We, we've had some uh, concerns expressed about local governments being able to to handle that and her having the level of sophistication needed to handle those mm -hmm. issues. I think we take exception a little bit to the Herald Leader's editorial on that because we have, as you know, city officials that uh, that occupy uh, very professional positions. They're just as sophisticated and intelligent and capable uh, as the politicians in Frankfurt. We think, again, it provides another avenue when you're dealing with an antiquated constitutional provision that doesn't allow revenue options. You uh, advise cities about lots of things and lots of conundrums. What are you telling Lexington about this center point situation, uh, the big hole in the middle of downtown that uh, for now is going nowhere? That's right, and our offices are right across from the big hole, so I look You've at them every view. day. Yeah. I have a great view. Um, you know, I think um, looking at the bigger picture, it's not often that you get a chance to really define what a, an American city's downtown looks like. And so I think it would be great if, if uh, the city keeps for, moving forward and, and trying to find a solution to this and really um, takes the time. I know it's been a long time, but you're going to get one shot at this, and it needs to be done right because it really will define what Lexington is for the future. Do you think at the end of this session it will be a good one for cities? I think so, yes. All right. Gentlemen, thanks. We appreciate it. I know it's back to Frankfurt, back to work for you. That's right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Kentucky Newsmakers on WKYT, and we hope you make it a good week ahead.